So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our first speaker representing the 34th Senate State Senate District, which includes the cities of Anaheim, Buena Park, Fullerton, Garden Grove, Santa Ana, Stanton, and Westminster, and especially because he's an alumni of Cal State Fullerton. Um, please help me welcome Honorable Senator Lou Correa. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. You have to wake me up. Uh, first of all, welcome to the 34th State Senate District, Central Orange County, where I call home. I've lived here uh, probably about 47 years now. It's a great place. Right down the street, you have the happiest place on earth, Disneyland. It is the happiest place on earth, and I can tell you a substantial percentage of the people that come here as tourists are from foreign countries. Asia and of course Latin America, primarily Mexico. Uh, let's take a moment again to thank all the organizers today, Priscilla and all the sponsors. Let's give them a round of applause one more time, please. And I'm also gonna ask you to thank the servers out there, the waiters and waitresses that are serving you because they live in my district and I work for them, so to speak. That's the way democracy works. And um, so I would say, gracias a los servidores para ser, por servirnos hoy. You know, as a state senator, one of the biggest challenges that we have, not only in the state, in this country, and by this world, is creating jobs. Very challenging time. So uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do over the last few years is take a page off uh, Bill Clinton's playbook and create jobs through exports. Um, and that has led me through some very interesting uh, roads in my life. I currently chair the Calif California Europe Select Committee, the California Mexico Select Committee, and I'm also on the Border Legislative Border Legislators Conference, which is a group of legislators from the U.S. border states and the Mexican border states, addressing the issues. One of them being economic development. And if you pull back and you look at that whole border region, that represents the third largest economic engine in the world. The third largest. We all talk about California as the seventh largest economy. Well, that whole area is the third largest economy in the world. Um, so we're looking at that, but also looking at, of course, China, the fastest economic uh, growing region in the world. And I can tell you that I've actually personally have led uh, a couple of delegations, a few delegations actually, of some of California's best, which one of those being biotechnology, to try to enter into agreements with uh, Chinese uh, groups to continue to market our products. And I believe California is still and will be the leader in biotechnology for the uh, foreseeable future. And we offer products here that can save lives of many people around the world, and at the same time create jobs here in the state of California. You know, uh, throughout my life I've always asked myself, what is international trade? And I can tell you, as a first, when I graduated from law school and business school, I did an internship with the Foreign Service. Then I spent almost a decade as an investment banker doing a lot of international work, so I found out what yen denominated, denominated debt was. I, I found out what yen commercial paper was. I found out what euro bonds were. I found out what sovereign debt were. I found out how to do IPOs in foreign markets of American firms. And, you know, as I kept asking myself, what is international business? What's an international product? Um, one day, uh, one of my uh, colleagues, he was a broker, uh, selling stocks to Americans from foreign firms, comes to me and says, hey Lou, I just invested in a piece of real estate here in Cerritos, can you help me? I think I got some tenants that are coming over and I want to rent this house to them and it's a very expensive house, uh, very high rent, so I want you to come with me. You're an attorney, help me execute the rental contract. And I thought to myself, well, this should be an easy deal. So I said, okay, Alex, I'll go with you. And Alex was from Taiwan. So we both drive down to his beautiful house that he just finished purchasing. And as we get there, I pull up the driveway. I see this young couple with three kids. And the rent was about $4,000. This was about 15 years ago. And I said, uh-oh, 
young couple, kids, 4,000 a month. So then I asked the young man, I said, so you know, it's first, last, plus deposit. He said, here's a cash. So all these alarms are going off in my head. Drugs, drugs, drugs. And the young man looked like the kind of guys that I grew up with, a lot of tattoos. And I said, oh my God, I know what this is about. So I did a little bit of due diligence and I found out that this young man who was no, no more than 23 years old and his wife looked like she was 18 and again, three kids. I found out that this young man, his passion in life was low riders. And he was an expert at building hydraulic system for cars. And guess what he was doing? He was selling them in Japan. This very young age, this young man had figured out how to put these systems together and sell them overseas, and he was making a very nice earning. We rented him the house, and I thought to myself, this is a clear example of not high-tech, you know, sophisticated financing mechanism for international business, but rather just a gentleman, a young man who took his passion, did what he could do, made it the best he could, and then he started marketing by accident his products overseas. It's doing very well. So a few months later, I'm flying back from Tokyo on a business class, and I'm sitting there, you know, trying to decompress from the two weeks of business. And next to me is sitting this young man. He looks like a surfer from Huntington Beach. And I thought to myself, what the hell are you doing in business class, right? So I struck up a conversation with this young man and wanted to know what the hell he was doing in Tokyo, flying back in this very expensive plane with a very expensive ticket. Well, <clears throat> guess what he came up with? He worked at a, at a local airport and found out that there's this really neat stuff to shine cars, the stuff that, the wax that they use essentially on airplanes. Good stuff, and somehow he figured out that people in Tokyo, people in Japan, people in Asia would be very interested in buying the best wax that you could get to take care of your car. So guess what he did? He created a door-to-door -door sales force of recent college graduates and he was selling this wax with a big margin in Asia and making a mint. Made in the USA. And I thought, these are examples of not rocket science, but rather what business is, which is common sense. Figuring out what you do best and figuring out the distribution system and going there and selling it. And I think that, in my opinion, been dabbling with international business now for 25 years, that is really the key. California has a lot of products to offer that are not even on the radar screen, so to speak. And it's up to you here, the entrepreneurs, to figure out what those products are, find your market niche, and sell them. I've been to China now by a half dozen times. Good friend that I work with has probably been there 30 times. And it's interesting going through the learning process. And my advice to all of you is do your due diligence. You're a businessman, you know the risks you've got doing business in California. Double that a couple of times and you know you're gonna have risks doing business overseas. Who are you doing business with? Because I'll tell you, I've run into some very interesting characters that represent to me that they know the world or that they know the sister of Mao and they can get me in somewhere, okay? And then I found other people who are really there to do business with you. And uh, so again, my first, if I can walk away with any message to you is number one, you know your product, know your distribution system, do your due diligence, please. And always have an exit strategy. I met a gentleman in China the last time I went, I had dinner with him, as a biotech firm. He's establishing this stuff, he's doing stuff that I can't even describe because I did not take those chemistry classes. But he decided he is gonna stay in China and live in China for the rest of his life. And that's great. 
so he doesn't have to worry about repatriating his currency back to the U.S. But those are challenges, and you got to figure out how you're going to do that. So again, I, I commend all of you for doing this because, again, as a state senator, I'm invested or vested in you to make sure that you succeed in creating jobs in the state of California through exports. Bill Clinton did it. We can do it again. Thank you very much. And again, thank all of the people here sponsoring. I, I thank the delegates for being here today. Good luck in making those contacts. And, and keep me in the loop. Thank you very much. Okay, now for the first panel, it will be moderated by uh, Mr. Richard Swanson, another friend of mine from the director. He's the director of the Pacific South Region of the Office of Domestic Operations for the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service, better known as International Trade Administration or the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce. Um, he has actually been with the U.S. Department of Commerce for 21 and a half years. Did you start when you were 10, Richard? I mean, that's, that's kind of a long time. Um, he oversees Nevada, California, and Hawaii, and incidentally, the highest grossing per capita for retail sales and tra travel and tourism in the United States um, through the UCAC. Uh, actually, one of the things that's exciting about Richard is he's also a Cal State Fullerton alumni, especially of Mihalo College. So, yay, go Titans. Um, so please help me welcome Richard Swanson. Great, well welcome everybody, and uh, it was great to see Lou again, a fellow Titan, and Enrique as well, and AQ. It's good to see these guys are finally getting a little gray hair on the side of the temples. <laughs> finally, okay, it's gonna be a while till you catch up to me. Um, okay, so let's get started with our panels. Um, the Global Trade Summit, we're going to talk about growth opportunities in China. But, uh, and this is a photo of, of a trip I made to the Great Wall while I was in China. It was uh, before the Olympics and before the airport had finished. And if anybody's been to China recently in Beijing, you'll know that flying in is quite, quite the experience to that airport. Um, but first I'd like to say, uh, I'd like to introduce our folks who are on the ground here. I'm part of our regional operation for Nevada, California, and Hawaii now, but uh, we have our director for Orange County, Paul Timbacus. Paul, can you stand up? And then we also have uh, Mary Avis Bokel, who is our um, senior trade specialist. And uh, we have Jason Sproul, I can't really see with the lights, uh, who is one of our specialists in the aerospace industry. And we have, we have Kristen Houston back there, who is a specialist in services, apparel, and franchising. And are we missing anyone else? Ah, Raul Lozano, yes. Mr. IT, the ICT industry, yeah. The other component here with the U.S. Department of Commerce, and we're really the U.S. Commercial Service, uh, and, uh, is, is our Export Council. And that's our advisory group. They are private citizens out there. They are nominated through us. They are appointed by the Secretary of Commerce. And our representatives today are Guy, Guy Fox, stand-up guy, who is the chair of the Southern California Export Council, both LA and Orange County. And uh, we have also Janet Wang, uh, I believe, who is a new member of the Export Council, an expert on foreign direct investment, if I might add. Uh, we have Patrick Mulcahy of Team China, I believe, is here today, and uh, Randall, you're, you're here today as, as a DEC member and an SBDC counselor, so uh, if anybody else I missed, uh, let me know. All right, um, I'm going to move along here. Basically, we have a national export initiative, okay? It's been going on since March of 2010. The president asked us if we would double exports in five years. Now, we're on track to do that technically because of some, you know, some situations involving currency exchange and also the fact that U.S. exports have been accelerating the last two years by at least 15 to 17 percent. And so uh, what this has translated into recently is that all of our partners and our local communities, such as the municipalities and the counties and the states, have figured out that in order to do that, we have to partner with organizations such as yours. And there's no way we're gonna double exports. 
So uh, this, this national initiative has now scaled down to the local level, both the state level, the county level, and the municipal level, and we're seeing that happen today. The Los Angeles Export Council was launched last month. That's a local derivative of the California STEP program, and you'll hear from Jeff Williamson today, the statewide director, about the overall California state trade export program. Now, the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service, the U.S. Commercial Service, these are our assets. Uh, commercial intelligence, trade consulting, B2B matchmaking, trade advocacy, and what we've been deemed to support uh, now is foreign direct investment. And what we call that in the Commerce Department is Select USA, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, and we'll talk about foreign direct investment in general. Um, the case for exports, I think uh, AQ mentioned, Alberto mentioned that 96%, we say 95% of the customers, but 87% of the growth is going to be taking place outside of the United States. And the CEO, uh, you know, the CEOs out there in the United States know this. Um, the CEO of GE uh, once was quoted recently as saying that 67% uh, of their revenue generation is going to come from two countries, and that'll be India and China. So, you know, we've had a lot of opportunities today to explore China. Uh, and these are some of the exports that come out of Orange County through our office. And, uh, you know, these are some of the industries that you'll see, uh, and they vary. So when we talk about exporting, let's also talk about what subsectors of our economy. We have the most diverse economy in Southern California. I think Orange County is probably pound for pound, uh, probably the most compacted, impacted uh, uh, county for having a diverse range of companies. We range from a, a plethora of apparel companies here, the surf industry apparel sector. We have medical devices, bio, biotechnology. We have environmental construction, ICT. Uh, and you know we have services. And I think one of the things, one of the growth opportunities that you really have to pay attention today is services. And you're going to find that in all sorts of things that both you and I do here in Orange County, okay? And this is where I think the real growth subsector is uh, within the China market. And uh, we'll have these experts talk about that. Now, my colleague uh, from the XM Bank, David Josephson, could not make it today, so I said I would put up a couple slides. XM Bank, like SBA, uh, tries to help with the trade finance aspect of this uh, you know, equation for exporting. And they do so through, through credit insurance to support your overseas foreign receivables so that you can extend those to your customers overseas. And they also do that through um, foreign buyer uh, capital equipment financing. And uh, they also have project financing as well. Uh, so call XM Bank. Uh, let us know uh, if you have any of these issues. Uh, they uh, have a great tool online. Um, it's their country risk schedule. So for every country they do business with in the world, you can take a look at what the risk assessment is for that country. So in general, that's very helpful. But credit's a, a main aspect of trade. Trade finance, marketing, commercial intelligence, training, all very strong components. Uh, our performance, here's our performance. California exports a lot, you guys, $143 billion. Estimated manufactured goods out of Orange County is, is uh, you know, well over, uh, well over 10 to 15 billion dollars, and that's not counting tourism, education and training, services that are being run out of accounting firms or uh, consulting agencies or engineering and architectural services. Some of our key markets in, uh, in, uh, in, in California, China, um, and some other performance numbers here, and some success stories that we've had locally here in Southern California. And uh, we've got great relations going with China in terms of commercial relations. I think that was exhibited recently with the president's talk with Chairman Hu. So um, I think we're setting the stage for our panels to get into this. But I wanted to throw this one up here. As you know, you know the Chinese um, are beginning to come to the United States. The visa situation is opening up a little bit. Um, Last summer, not this last summer, but the summer before last, we had 12,000 Chinese come through the, the um, Anaheim Orange County Convention and Visitors Bureau. This was unprecedented. So, for example, some of the retail centers, uh, South Coast Plaza being one, has used this model to help their retailers understand the cult, and Enrique brought this up, the cultural nuances of doing business with some of the Chinese. 
I don't find this to be too stereotypical, but the fact is is that you know you can read up, but nothing will replace face-to-face -face contact. And remember that. You want to have face-to-face -face contact either in the country or here. And today we welcome the delegates from China. We hope to meet with you and explore some of the business opportunities uh, that are out there. So are they a partner? Are they a competitor? Yes. Is competition good? Yes. It brings out the best in us. So, so as I say, bring it on. Uh, lastly, um, foreign direct investment um, is a great opportunity for all of us. The Chinese are probably going to come to the United States uh, to look for opportunities to put a, a huge cash reserve that they possess. Now they want to do that with the best assets that will generate the best ROI to them. And I think the assets here in Orange County are phenomenal. So take a look at that aspect of, of doing business. Foreign direct investment is a great opportunity to develop the infrastructure we need in Southern California and Orange County, but it's also a way of doing business. And it can become a unilateral business. Not only can you import, but you also can export. There's lots of opportunities in foreign direct investment, and our Select USA program over here is, is one of those vehicles that we're beginning to develop. Um, here we are represented in China. All of our folks on the table here have utilized our offices. They can talk about that. We're very uh, concentrated in Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou and southern China. We represent uh, two aspects within the U.S. commercial service overseas. One aspect is the commercial officer, you and me, who is rotated out of every embassy and consulate every three or four years. But then there's the Foreign Service National who is an expert in industry and cultural relations that you can develop great relationships with. I think Jeff will talk about that as well when he's up here. And then uh, don't forget India too. When you talk about China, think about India as well. So uh, let's uh, finish up here. Um, we'll get into some of these aspects about foreign direct investment and, and some opportunities. But here's Paul's information here. And Randall, we'll start with you. And Randall and I have known each other for quite a while. Uh, Randy was a client of uh, the Department of Commerce way back when, and, and just recently, uh, through Sir Speedy, which was a printing uh, company here that you may have seen. But what's interesting about that is that that company used a franchising model to expand its business overseas. And franchising is another way to leverage sales and marketing efforts without you know, uh, putting out a lot of upfront uh, capital investments. So Randy, let's get your... Uh, let's get your um, PowerPoint all teed up here. Sean, we may need you back. Good morning, and in cowboy language, howdy, which in Chinese language is ni hao, ni hao ma, and I would say wan ying to our honored guests from China. Welcome. I know why you are here, because you are facing important business decisions, and you believe that an informed business decision has a higher probability of being a successful business decision. So one of the roles that I have and that this conference has is to provide you information, at least the beginning of some information and opportunities to get more of that information so that you can increase the probability of success of your business decisions, especially when that decision is related to entering a market outside the U.S. Now, my objective, for my part, is to stimulate some, some interest again, so that I'm not going to give you lots of stuff to take notes about, but to have you spot something that is interesting and relevant just to you, and then make a note, then make an appointment with me, at the CITD, and we can sit down, no charge to you, and we can dig deeper into that particular set of information, whether it's market sector or market selection outside the US or industry sector that you're in. Whatever the characteristics are of your business decision to grow your business outside the United States, which of course we are very confident will create new jobs in the United States, then we can assist you in doing that, as, as Hetz has said so eloquently. Um, the topic of growth opportunities in China, I could put it rather simply, 
because a number of us here in the room, we could talk about China all day or, or even all week. But I would say two things. The opportunity is big, it's huge, and it's for everyone. It isn't just for the major multinational companies that are U.S. household brand names. It is literally for almost everyone who's a business person in Orange County, and certainly I would believe most people in the room. Those of you who are in public service, perhaps excluded, but those of you who are in the private sector who are business owners and managers, then there's opportunity for you. Uh, just by way of credibility, not to make me seem special, but to give some credibility to not only the information I'm providing you, but the value of the, consul the counseling and consultation with me, uh, I've had a pretty fair amount of experience in including Chinese Taipei. We have to get accustomed to calling Taiwan Chinese Taipei and in the PRC in mainland China for over a period of about 15 years. I've been there a pretty fair amount, boots on the ground value. The, I'd like to attribute the information that I'm going to put on the screen, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid death by PowerPoint and just give you lots of bullet points and figures and numbers, but again, to pique your interest, but to attribute the information that I gathered for this presentation, a good deal of it comes from the Department of Commerce, the International Trade Administration, the U.S. Commercial Service, and Richard and I have a, a good friend who's currently serving as the most senior Department of Commerce officer at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. His name is Bill Zaret. So a good deal of this information I drew from Department of Commerce sources and then vetted it and got some advice from our friend Mr. Zaret to make sure that I put up here what are significant and important points and to leave a lot of the huge numbers and comparison scales and charts out of it because that isn't our purpose uh, today. Mr. Zaret is happily serving in Beijing in the U.S. Embassy and he is reporting today to our ambassador to China, Mr. Gary Locke. Mr. Locke assumed the position of ambassador recently. Previous to that, he was the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. So there is a, a we could call it a food chain almost. We might even think of it as Guangxi. There's a set of relationships among many of us here in the room and support people and services for you in other markets, China, but also in, in other parts of Asia, in Latin America, in the, in the Middle East, in India, and beyond. China has many faces. It's a marvelous, wonderful place with wonderful people. I feel so grateful that I am alive today because during a period of about a half a century, starting maybe 15 or 20 years ago maybe, there is more change affecting more people, more money, more geography, and extending into the future more time than has happened on the face of the planet in the history of mankind, and that is happening in China. And the good news for us is we can participate, even if it's virtually and online. We can be aware, we can be informed, we can watch this change happening. And you should plan to get yourself in person over there and experience it firsthand in any of its many faces. It's a big place. A couple of salient points. China is a producer and consumer of 40%. This is compared to the world. They're the 40% coal market share person. Not all of that or much of it actually is exported, but they're a big coal user. Cement, they produce, but they also import a lot of cement, which then is a component of concrete. The buildings are actually concrete. Cement is what binds the components together. Steel, 33% of world market share in use. Iron ore, 43%. Number one vehicle market. Number one internet users in the world. 
That's an important point for a lot of us. In my last slide, you'll see that that means there's an opportunity, a big one. There are more mobile online service users uh, in China than in the US, I, I believe. And if you will contact me, I'll give you a link to a video of a Charlie Rose interview with a Chinese woman who talks about the use of social media and uh, also websites in China. There's a misunderstanding here about access to and use of the web in China. It's a marvelous piece. I won't go into detail. Just contact me and I'll get you the link to watch that interview. I think it will change your perception of China, most of you at least. China now, the good parts. World's second largest economy, a GDP of uh, nearing six and growing at a pretty rapid pace at 10 some percent currently. Their GDP per capita, meaning if we divide their GDP by all the bodies, is about 4660, which might not seem in comparison to the same figure for the US to be a very big number. But remember, we've got uh, how many people over there to divide that <laughs> big number up? So we divide it out and get a fairly small number. But your customers will have a much higher per capita share of that GDP, we hope, in their pocket. The China's the, are the number three foreign export market for the United States. They're a very strong financially uh, set up market with a trade surplus in the 273 billion range. US exports to China, with the, we always think, most of us think of China as exporting to us. But China is a very, very significant importer from the United States. U.S. exports to China, I believe this is, is a late 2010 figure, $91 billion. That's a pretty fair chunk of change. And they have strong foreign reserves exchange, so we don't have to worry too much about the solvency of that market. And if you look at other markets around the world, some of them are on a little shaky fin financial ground. I don't think China is. Now, it's not appropriate to only talk about the rosy pictures, the good stuff, without at least considering that it's not perfect. A couple of characteristics here that we might think of are, I don't like the word bad, but they're challenges that China faces, especially in the near term, in the next decade. Their urban disposable income, the money in the pocket that a person living in a city has to buy something, we hope, from you, is $28.95, but in the rural areas of China, and if we went back to that map and looked at the city plots, and that'll come up again, you'll see that there are great expanses of rural population, rural economy, and look at the difference in the money that they have in their pocket. That's one of the challenges that the Chinese government is facing, and they have a plan to change that. We'll see a little bit about that. Healthcare, health in general, is a challenge for the government and the population in China. There are 200 million people uninsured. There are wide gaps between urban and rural access to healthcare, insurance aside, but just access to high quality healthcare. One tenth of their population is carrying hepatitis B. That's a big challenge for the healthcare systems in China. Education is another challenge that they face, especially for rural and migrant students, migrant workers. A good deal of the economic activity in China is uh, conducted, performed. The labor comes from migrant workers who move from season to season, crop to crop, and their, their education access and support for the students of those migrant workers has some challenges, some 77 million students to try and give a good education to. The good stuff, positive business outlook for U.S. companies doing business in China. Now, in this case, we're talking about a U.S. company that has a formal presence in China. They have an office there, at least. These figures come from the... Uh, AmCham is American Chamber of Commerce, and there's an AmCham in most major cities in nearly every country in the, in the world, and, and that's not just American branded businesses, but also local 
businesses who join that chamber and they share best practices and information and support each other. So 71% uh, increase in revenue, 90% are optimistic, 85% will increase their investment. Performance of US companies, 87% reported revenue growth, 79% said they're very profitable, 61% are increasing their market share. The trends are, that are good for us, newly emerging markets. The top 14 cities, not just the well-known ones, account for 50% of US exports. That's where your customers are, not just in Beijing and China. The middle class, the people with money in their pocket in 2009 was about 5%. By 2020, it'll be nearly half the population. Urbanization is a trend, so that people are coming from the rural areas where they don't have a lot of income and disposable income, not just into the major well-known cities, but into the sec secondary and tertiary cities. In 2005, there was a 43% uh, urbanization of formerly rural people, and in 2010, it goes up to 47%, and they have a target in 2025 of a migration from rural to urban of a couple hundred million people. Now there's, a, there's something in China you need to understand. It's a different political organization than the one we have here, a fairly autocratic government. So when they make a plan, like their periodic five-year plans, they're in the, about the middle of their 12th five-year plan, they put, can put some muscle into it and make things happen. Government expenditure is targeted to rise by 8%. GDP, you can read some of those uh, figures, but look at the ones in bold. 45 million jobs to be created in urban areas. Those are customers for you. That's that growing middle class. The magic seven in the current 12-year plan, new energy, energy saving and environment protection, biotech, new materials, clean energy vehicles, high-end manufacturing, next generation information technology, economic restructuring. They have to restructure the economy. I'm not an economist. I have to go to people smarter and more knowledgeable than I am in order to understand that, but I believe what they tell me. Innovation is part of the government's forward-looking plan, and they can make these things happen. They have the strength to do it. Environment and clean energy, no surprise here. They have a target of environmental protection investment increasing uh, by the government of 10%. Energy consumption cut, energy consumption from non-fossil fuel increasing to 11%. Non-carbon, or carbon dioxide emissions, they want to cut that by 17%. So they are a player in conserving the planet. Water consumption value added output, they want to cut that by uh, 30%. Livelihood, they got a population of nearly a billion and a half people. They want to increase the per capita income by 7%. The government funding for affordable housing in that plan is increased by nearly 15%. Minimum wage up already 13%. Wage rates are from a number there. Education spending up nearly 20%. I like to round a little bit higher, came from a marketing background. Healthcare expenditures up 16%. They're facing those challenges that we saw a little bit earlier. What are the best prospects for US businesses? Environmental technology, energy, coal, nuclear, smart grid or intelligent grid, healthcare, transportation, outbound tourism, education. Renewable energy opportunities include wind, they're the largest producer and user of it, and solar power, of course, photovoltaic production, they make a lot of stuff there, but they export most of us. They want to, they, most of it. They want to start using more of it in-house. Water, 20% of it is not clean and usable for industry. A big investment through 2016 to meet that challenge, to curb the heavy metal pollutions. Air pollution is a tough situation. 400,000 deaths a year because of dirty air. Healthcare, huge opportunity for the U.S. because we have the knowledge, the technology, and the experience. Big part of the 12-year plan. Outbound tourism, something that we really like here, meaning outbound from China to here. It's the U.S. fourth largest source for tourists coming to the U.S. Chinese travelers, there's some numbers for you. They spend about six grand each time they come here. Apparently most of it at South Coast Plaza. Is that what I heard Richard saying? 
No endorsement. No just endorsement. Just Tourism just revenues for commentary. China from Chinese <laughs> residents are up 60 some percent in the first three quarters of 2010. Education, big opportunity for us. We saw the challenges they have in education. And this is my last slide, second to last, and I just want to quickly mention to you because it's relatively new, all of that list of best prospects you might think are only for big companies. But this is a website, easy to get to, exportnow.com. It's founded and launched recently by a former undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade, Frank Lavin. He also has a book called Export Now that I highly recommend. <laughs> Go there to that site. That is you here in Orange County selling your U.S. consumer goods directly to the consumers in China online. There's an end-to-end -end solution being designed by those folks. Thank you for your time and attention and to our Chinese guests. Great job. Thanks, Randy. Uh, ben Lai uh, is based here in Orange County, thankfully, uh, but he represents both LA and Orange County with his um, China US Business Association. And, and uh, what I've liked about doing programs with Ben uh, over the last few years is that he's bringing the China opportunities closer and closer to us with this idea that China is not only coming over here for foreign direct investment to look for opportunities, but it's also going to Mexico and developing uh, their own maquiladora uh, system there for, for participating in, uh, in markets here in the United States. And uh, Ben is out there to help us sort of solve that equation. How can we provide a supply chain uh, from Orange County, for example, to that market and uh, various other markets as well? So Ben, take us, take us forward. Thank you. This is Ben, Ben Lai. I see a lot of dedication from China or somewhere. How many people understand Chinese? Say Chinese. Can you raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Uh, I roughly introduced who am I. Actually, um, uh, I came to this country 32 years ago. I'm half a Chinese and half the American. I live in here 32 years. I was born and raised in Taiwan and 30 years when I came to this country. This country done so much for me, and I want to do something for this country, for our community. I had my honor and privilege here. Uh, I just came back to ch from China about less than a month ago. Uh, <coughs> I think everyone give you a lot of big picture about how grows the China the opportunity, but I will give you the reality, how to get into. Because I believe a lot of big corporations already in China we don't have to worry about that. The we have to worry about is the small business, how to get into. For the last few years, I believe uh, a lot of my friends, including my daughters, lost job. Many of my friends lost their house too. And I asked myself, what can I do for this country, for this community? I know two languages, I understand two culture, and I understand many things about the trade, and I had two connections. I wanted to step in to do whatever I can to bring the job here, bring the economy back to the United States. I sincerely hope tonight, today I can bring something for you and help you. Back to 2008, when I was in conference in China, uh, they interviewed me, and I told them, China, you're gonna face three big challenges. First, your labor cost is going to increase. You lost the best beneficial. Number two, pollution and, and, and logistic. Your material cost is going to increase. Number third, your 3.2 trillion RMB reserve. Your RMB value is going to increase. You lost three benefits. Besides, the United States going faced economic crisis immediately. How do I say that? I roughly tell you, you know how much debt we have? 4.33 billion, correct? I talked to my daughter, I said, do you know how much the 4.3 trillion stand for? She said, no. I said, I'll give you an idea. If we pay without spending a dime for coffee, a hundred million dollars a day, 
were paid for 389 years. That's how much we're into trouble. My daughter was shocked. I said, okay, that's how we are. And how do I know that? Back to then, 2008, I knew we have 400 some billion dollars federal government deficits. We have 35 billion and 65 billion dollars monthly trade deficits. We're in deep trouble. But unfortunately, it happened. I roughly tell who am I, because China government invited me to go down there to talk, to spend a lot of time in China. Uh, they want to know who am I. And my assistant told them, said, don't worry, I use my name Ben Lai. In the United States, nobody knows me. But my Chinese name pop out because of publication. And I speak for the college, even pop out. I roughly tell you who am I. Actually, uh, when I was up to 15 years old, I was, I was a dis disability kid. I suppose a huge China boy. But back until my love changed, my parents' love changed me. By two, 20, 21 years old, I was a student leader in my country. Did you know the largest student, student uh, economic association in the world? I was national president. And I would join the uh, World Conference in Amsterdam. I bring all, all the student leaders from economic and trade, from Germany, Switzerland, every country to Taiwan for the conference. And I, 32 years ago, I married my wife's Korean in Kansas country. It's new. Before I came to this country, I was working for a big corporation, import one third of meat and all the food stuff into Taiwan. And I was the sales manager. All the department comes from embassy asked me, said, can I have lunch with you? We have a group coming. That's how I know how, what kind of service they have. Department commerce, they are very good. They do a lot of things, uh, promote the business. They said, we will have group come here, can you help us in two? My job is, if you bring a chocolate, any merchandise, give me a month and a half, I can tell you exactly the sellable and not sellable, how the price in the market, and then what the quantity can sell. That's my background in internal trade. After I came to this country in 2000, uh, 1979, uh, two years later, I have a first Chinese school in Orange County, Northern Orange County, and I told them the gray, Chinese circle were forming. And China and US gonna have a conflict in the future because resource. The time, almost 28 years ago, they was laughing at me. I said, you watch, Chinese language gonna be very important. And I told them why. Besides Japan, there's four small dragon, except Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore speak Chinese. And China go rise. They make it so much different. Now you understand what I'm saying. And the resource and energy shortage, we're going to comfort each other. I think time's right. 2008, when I spoke to them, they came out 100,000 publishing. They found out I predict was right. So they want to know who am I. So my assistant, you don't have to hide. They'll find you in Chinese language from now. <laughs> OK, I'll roughly give you the how China, the growing. I'll give outline a few things. The China market, I believe everyone give you a big picture already. How to create a China trade between China and US. How, to, how they invest into the US now. And the contact information, I'll give you one. This is China. I just came back from China uh, less than a month ago. The China sites, and I will tell you, you just map, I'll agree to show you. This is world's second largest economic, $5.7 trillion. Dollars. And also, the world's largest producers, concrete steel, fertilizer, crops, and everything. That's how they do. World's largest population, it means consumer, right? It's the fastest growing economy for the last 30 years. I just talked to you simply for trade, for international, for the uh, importing from China. A lot of people are outsourcing. We just have a uh, conference in what, Mexico and China. But actually, honestly, I'll tell you, November, just uh, less than two weeks ago, they have a conference and expo in Mexico City called Expo China Mexico. They are aware. They will get a piece of pie from the China growing. November 16 to 18, I have a booth there. Federal government from the Mexico will put an effort 
just like we are. We have competition coming. A lot of people use outsourcing because they get a cheaper labor and a cheaper material. But can we benefit from it? Yes. Most import they come here, not only for locally, they export into the South, South America and Mexico. It's a big city, for, a big market for us. Don't forget, that's a big one. I was talking to export to China. I explained to you what the growing middle class. They buy the luxurious good, the great wine, and tell education one by one. I'll let you understand the market, how big, and how many people, 1.3, 1.4 billion people. A lot of people doesn't know how big size in middle class in China now. It's about our population, 250 to 300 million population in China is middle class. What's the name for middle class? They own the car, they own the house, they own the good job and investment. And every few years, that's about half of the American side, the population move into the city. The great demand for the housing. Many of my friends bought a house about five years ago. One house, they increase five times the value. If they own five houses, you know what I'm talking. Just like you bought a house in here, uh, 500,000 become $2.5 million, and you have five houses. What does it stand for? You put 20 or 30% down payment. What kind of wealth they accumulate? That's the middle class in China now. They have a huge power. You know what, I, for example, I give you an example, the grape wine. The Orange County Business Council was have a meeting. They want to do something with China. They asked me, said, what can we do? The BP, I told them, said, what do you want to do? The time was wine there. I forgot what it was written. I said, do we produce a lot of grape wine in California? I said, yes, we produce a lot. Can we do something? I give an idea, I said, look, 2003, the French start exporting grape wine to China. By 2010, last year, how much percent they grow? They said, gotta be 50, 80 percent. I said, can be higher than double. He said, you mean 150 percent? I said, how about double? 300 percent. Man, that's a lot. I said, how about double and double? 600 percent and 1,200 percent. Actual number is 7,000 percent. I want to tell you, okay? You want to get luxury goods? How China last year spent the money in tourists into the Paris? How much? Everyone can give me a number? Buy the Gucci bag, buy any polo shirts? Anybody give me a number? Just one year. How much the tourists from China into the Paris spend the money? Anybody? Give me a number. Patrick is one expert. Uh, people, we have a few million people. Yeah, that's why we reached us, said South Coast Plaza, you know, market director Warren said, man, we have a lot of people come. Once they hire a Chinese employee, they pop 30%, 40% of business. I tell you why. They spent $6.1 billion in Paris. Even the government was shocked. That's what we need in this economy. We need to bring them here. Give them a visa tourists. I told them many years ago. Give me a visa, let them come and spend money. Each one of them spend $6,325 in the tours. That's how they do it. Do we have market here? Yes, we do. Education, you know what education stand for? I have a dinner, banquet in Korea, Council General House, resident. Uh, right next to me is the Vice Council General from China, the son. He says this to me. We're dining with the uh, Philippine Council General and then a Japan Council General, we have dinner together. And I said, why are you so busy? He said, you know how many people just came from summertime here? 70 some thousand students lunching in the United States. We were so busy, swam day and night. Is there a lot of business here? Yes. How many people students going to send here? To the United States, you guess 100,000 students. You know how much pay in USC? Anybody from USC? I spend fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. Correct? That's money supposed in here. Can we get beside this business? Yes. The housing, medical, whatever you think about that. They ask me many questions. What can we do? Can you help me? Green energy. 
RV. You know what the RV stand for? Zhang, the friend of us, said, in China, the people have money. They start to use RV camping wherever they go. We heard no one buying RV. They buy a tons of in China. You said, crazy, who's going to buy those ones? But actually, they don't, they don't understand. Even just like many years ago, they asked me, say, Ben, they're so poor. They make $200 US dollars a month. How can I afford to go Kentucky Fried Chicken? $7 or $8? I said, very simple. One million people in the city just visit once a year for the birthday party. You know how many people they had to slide into the McDonald's? That makes sense by number. Good. You know the Chinese investment in US? You see this one. Who said this one? It's coming. We have all the technology. We service business. Everything opportunity is coming to us. Correct? Agreement reached because the Syrian coming, entertainment, uh, investment all coming to here. I roughly tell you. One of my, one we have one Asian news business summit in the expo. Someone asked, "Can you help us?" Sir? This company here, they invest twenty-nine million dollars in a project because in the crisis everything stopped. They asked me, said, can you help us? I said, sure. I tell the way to help you. They have a new investment immigrant a visa company called EB5. They give each investment from 500,000 to $1 million. You can raise, this project is $70 million. I said, this project I'm going will create us 1,348 jobs for our local community. That's what I'm working for. This type of things, I think, very important for us to do that. How many people come in here, invest money here? All you can benefit is they buying a lot of housing now. Last week, group of good people buy cash and housing here, invest money here. They buy this hotel, purchase hotel in Mayor Hotel downtown, uh, Benaventure Hotel. They invest money in Universal City, the Sheraton Hotel. They purchase too. They also, when I visit China, many people ask me, "Can you help us?" Find a company with investment, everything. Also, a lot of local business and chambers said, no, we don't see anything, but we can benefit from that. I said, you know what? Sure, you can benefit. A few years ago, I asked my friend, say, you come here. He said, what can I do for this? I said, you know what? Come set a branch office. I'll help you market in here. I get a resource here. Get connection here. He said, okay. First one, I said, you need an attorney. We hire attorney. Extended visa, attorney got a job. Second, get an attorney, set up corporation, pay my attorney. You need a bank account, you need CPA, insurance, so what else? Rent the office and warehouse. Oh yeah, we need a realtor to find it. What else? I said, yeah, you have, buy equipment, hire people. He said, yes, we do. What else? I need to buy a car just like you have. Go, buy a car, rent a house, everything. So when I speak to the chairman come and say, can you benefit? Yes, you can benefit, all of them, just so you don't know. But important, you need to know. Thinking outside box, just thinking, oh, here we don't have, but you need to connect a lot of things to do that. So if we can bring 100, 1,000 company here to work with us, instantly we can bring a lot of job and money to this community. I could roughly give you what kind of things they're doing now. They buy a lot of milk, baby milk. They have 70 million baby bones a year. They need water treatment, the IT service. They have technology. I talked to the city, the biggest city in South Park. 20,000 items need purchased. I believe a lot of things in here. They need purchase from us, test equipment, everything. We're going to set an office to help them. The fun, if you or your friends say, look, I need to do something, but they don't have resource will help you to get into exporting business. And also, they have a buy soybean use the export. They buy billions of soybean they for the big milk. They need to have uh, meat from Iowa, for almost education, biochemistry, every industry they need it. I think, you know, roughly, if we want to do this one right, first one, when you need to equip it, you know to understand the culture. You need to understand culture, and you need to have 
Have you ever been visited China? How many people have visited China before? That's good. At least we a good start. It. We need to start training the people for internal trade from students starting. And we need to have a government support like a SBA, a Department of Commerce. And like what Richard said, we need a teamwork. We need teamwork to make it work. You know, when I went to, I just gave you a last, when I went to uh, China this April, to state of government uh, to meet the conference, uh, International Trade and Economic, the director. And after I finished, I come back. I went to China, to Taiwan, to see my mom's grave. My mom passed away. And I talked to my assistant, said, I have three days to go back to China. Company arranged right away. The first class ticket to me and my wife in China, in Taiwan, the flew to, to China. And they arranged the three days, everything. They spent 100 RMB in me with my assistant. They need a lot of information. Not many people have Chinese and American both knowledge in China and here. Now, I wanted to do something to help this community bring back economic and job creation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. Mark Matsumoto, who is the executive director for the California Education Training and Export Consortium, uh, which also has a derivative and a project going on that was funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce called the Vietnamese uh, Education and Training Export Consortium. Education is dear to our hearts. Uh, we have a lot of assets here in Orange County, Mark. You've worked with quite a few, so why don't you uh, take us to the break with a great scenario of education and training opportunities out there. I guess that's translation, keep it short and sweet. <laughs> How many of you have ever seen $5 billion? That's an awful lot of money. When I was a little kid, I remember you could go to Las Vegas and you could go to the Horseshoe Casino and you could see a million dollars and quite frankly, that was very impressive. Five billion dollars. That is what you see in the United States when Chinese students come to the United States. That's 150,000 plus students. You've heard about that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a specific opportunity and how a specific opportunity multiplies and mushrooms into something much more significant than it may seem. So maybe in this room we have Chinese students that are on visa, but there are over 200,000 in the United States. That's a significant army of Chinese that are learning about the United States, that are learning about consumption opportunities, and potentially they could be your partners. Oh, don't worry about the PowerPoint, we'll, we'll skip on that. Well, it's kind of funny, just to digress a little bit, when Senator Korea was up here, he said that 20 years ago he was learning or cutting his teeth doing international business going to Japan, that he had some slick young guy on the business class with him uh, coming back from Japan that was selling auto polish. And I had to stop for a moment and think, was that me? <laughs> it really was a deja vu moment because 15 years ago we'd be talking about how to break into Japan and all the opportunities there and just for the record my muse was not auto polish although I did sell quite a bit what I was selling door to door was disposers but during that process I gained a lot of knowledge and that knowledge told me that you never know where opportunity will come from and you're going to hear in the next panel actually how to do tactical business in China. I know we have a delegation here. It's not easy. You build this one trip at a time. But I have to tell you how this opportunity in education happened was, quite frankly, very accidental. Your next moderator, Jeff Williamson, and I, and, and a group of, uh, I guess, distinguished VIPs, we don't know where they are now, we went to a city in China that probably you've never heard of. Most of you know about Guangzhou, but have you ever heard about Jiangmen, China? That happens to be the sister city for Riverside, California. Well, my thought joining this mission was that, and this was 2001, there has to be a lot of opportunities. Maybe my disposer, maybe other products I'm selling, I can get into the pipeline in China. Again, 2001. But what we found out when we had these stage tours of many, many factories is that there is no way I'm going to sell this disposer, but I had five different Chinese factories trying to sell me turkey fryers. Now, this was November 15, 2001, and we were asking the factories, hey, you know, if they're not already in the United States, you're not going to be selling these turkey fryers. The biggest consumption is coming in about a week. 
But what happened at that time is we go through these factories and you find out they don't have a marketing arm. They don't have the proper research. They have tremendous needs for soft skills, for selling. And that eureka moment came that the opportunity may be in training or it may be in education. So in 2001, Jeff and I, we started down a quest to figure out how to promote education and training. And as my presentation says, what I've done for the last 10 years is really try to divine a way to promote education and training. The only problem was we thought, well, academic training would be a really great thing to promote in China in 2002, 2003. Big problem, how does a Chinese student get a visa? Well, things were to change. You saw the picture of Richard in his initial PowerPoint at the Great Wall. That was before he had the heart attack. But Richard and I went in the fall of 2005, and that was on the cusps of things changing in China. Well, as you heard today, 157,000 students are on F1 visa this year. That's a 23% growth over last year. And that's triple from 2007. Well, in this process, I think our organization, ETEC, has had a little to do with that. We've led many, many missions to China and many cities in China. But what we found out is the Chinese are not just coming to the United States. There's hundreds of thousands that are going to Canada, to Australia, to Singapore. So although there's a growth opportunity and although it's a big market, there is a lot of competition. And I'm sure you'll hear that in the next panel. But what we've had to do is focus how to promote. And I can tell you what we found out is that specific, whether it's community college programs, and I know Rancho is a sponsor here today, or if it's a Cal State system and it's the business school, certain programs have been very attractive in China. And that's what we've tried to market. And we've put schools together with agents, and we found that was very good. All the missions that we led allowed us to bring students to these US schools, but what we found is that the market is dramatically changing. There are thousands of study agents, hundreds and hundreds of US schools now promoting in China. So although there are growth opportunities, schools, trainers, professional service providers, franchise companies all have to look at the nuances where the future growth will go. And a few that I have isolated are kindergarten and elementary school, believe it or not, the next generation of the Chinese international student is not going to be starting in college. They're going to be starting at two, three, four years old. I was at a conference just a few weeks ago, and the interesting thing was, is it wasn't the universities that were the interesting topic here, it was Disney. Disney has 37 schools in China teaching two to eight year olds, and they're gonna to grow to 59. Well, why would Disney be interested to export and get in the education business? Why does McDonald's sell Happy Meals? Because that's their future growth target, and if they can reach these students through their images, through their um, proprietary features, then it's much better for them. So it's very interesting. So this K-12 market has become a growth opportunity. What other opportunities are there? Believe it or not, one of the biggest problems with the Chinese student coming to the United States is for the consulate, you heard a little bit from Ben, they're overwhelmed. There's hundreds of thousands of applications. But guess what? Most of those applications are fraudulent. So there is a tremendous need in China to have a vetting service. One of the reasons we've set up an office in China is so that we can have this direct relationship for the school and with the student so we know that this information that the school's getting is valid. So there's many opportunities to provide these services to support the actual student coming from China. Well, what's another opportunity? I think the most interesting thing about education is it's a platform. You start with the student coming to the United States. Maybe it's the K-12 student, maybe it's the college student uh, that's an undergraduate, or maybe it's a graduate student. But the interesting thing is that's just the starting point of the export and business opportunity. I think Ben alluded to this, that he has a lot of Chinese businessmen that say, I want a car like yours, or I want a house like yours. Well, I'll put it in perspective. This was an article that ran in the New York Times in August of this year. Much like Americans look to China for their toys and their Happy Meals, the Chinese are looking to America to buy luxury mansions. In this case, 
a Chinese businessman bought a high-rise condo in New York for $20 million for his daughter that was studying at a Manhattan University. Now, how is that? We think tuition of $5 billion a year from China is fantastic. Maybe it's 20, 30,000 a year, but that $20 million home sell and that commission is pretty significant. So this is just one of the many spillover effects. I'll give you another model. Uh, our office in China works with a school in Missouri called Southeast Missouri State. This is a college town in the most quintessential way. There are only two Chinese restaurants in town, and guess what drives their business? The 120 Chinese students that come in every year, and the roughly 400 Chinese students that have come to this little city outside of St. Louis and Missouri to study in the United States. So lots of businesses, whether in entertainment, they're in travel, they're in insurance, we have a small company that we work with in Los Angeles that provides dorm-style housing, and I'm very uh, liberal with that term, for Chinese students because they're right down in Koreatown, but they have 15 to 20 students every month that are in this housing paying anywhere from $600 to $1,000. These are the kind of businesses that I think Senator Korea was talking about. They may be off the beaten path, they may not be well known, but these are the opportunities because of this great surge of business with China. A kind of a last thing I would leave you with, or actually two things, one is the China effect. So what is happening? We have 150,000 plus students from China now in the United States. Maybe that will grow to two or 300,000. Well, that's phenomenal. So instead of $5 billion in tuition and another 10 billion in spillover, that may double. But the cautionary tell is, how many Chinese students can you have in an MBA program? How many Chinese students do you want in your intensive English program? When it becomes 30%, that's a little bit problematic. When it becomes 80%, that's unsustainable. This is the challenge that schools have, and this is the challenge a lot of businesses have. Last year, Chinese market grew by 24%, 23.9%. The rest of the world and the total international student growth to the U.S. was only 5%. So we can't overlook the market, but this is the challenge to us. And as kind of a lead into your next panel, which is actually how do you do business with China, I will tell you this, that our most um, salient observation about China is you need to be there. I've made about 20 trips in the last 10 years. We have a representative office in China. What we're telling schools now if they want to promote is they need to have their own people marketing, branding, and following up in China. But the cautionary tell is things are not always as they seem. And I always use this analogy of the live fish basket. When you go to China and you sit down in a seafood restaurant and someone orders seafood, most likely uh, a waiter will bring in a bucket a live fish. With the explanation, that's what you're going to be served. But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes what you're served is a little bit different. Sometimes the opportunities you're told about are a little bit different. But I'll leave that for a different presentation and I'll leave that to the next panel. If you would like to know more about educating uh, or exporting education, you can go to our website, studycalifornia.org. And I guess, Richard, do we have a few minutes for question and answer? Well, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll save the questioning on the ground. We'll take a uh, five-minute break to, to replenish here. Um, now, seize candies out there, and be sure you visit all the expo uh, tables, our sponsors and everybody. Take advantage of it. I want to make one clarification with Mark. It wasn't a heart attack we had. It was altitude sickness going up the Great Wall. <laughs> sorry. So if anybody's been to the Great Wall, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So let's make that clarification. I just want to let's give a round of applause to Ben Lai and Randy Long and Mark Matsumoto.